So as we have seen, uh, we cannot critically evaluate the different evolutionary theories that we have been looking at, nor can we construct a coherent evolutionary theory without defining the concept of species. So if what evolutionary theory says is something like new species have been forming, that some of the species have been bifurcating into different species, then obviously we have to begin by asking the question, what do we mean by species? That's, that's where we have to have a clear definition of species or a theory of species. So we begin with that question. What is species? The most popular definition of species is the so-called biological concept of species, and that comes from Ernest Meyer. And it goes like this, uh, species is defined as this, uh, two organisms belong to the species, belong to uh, the same species if and only if there are two conditions here. They are potentially capable of mating uh, to produce fertile offspring. So uh, if you take, uh, if you take, let us say, cats and elephants, obviously cats and elephants cannot mate, therefore cats and elephants belong to different species. You take cats and dogs, they cannot mate uh, to produce offspring, therefore cats and dogs belong to the same species. That's the basic idea. And there are cases where you have to apply the second part of the definition uh, to produce fertile offspring. So horses and donkeys can mate to produce offspring, but those uh, offspring are not fertile. So horses and donkeys belong to two different species. That's the basic idea of this definition of species. Now this has many serious problems. One problem is that of asexual reproduction. So if we assume that there exist different species in bacteria or in amoeba, since bacteria and amoeba do not engage in sexual reproduction, it means either that the concept of species is irrelevant for bacteria, for non-sexually reproducing organisms, or that every individual belongs to distinct species. So even any two bacteria two organisms. They are not capable of distinct uh, sexual reproduction, so that means they belong to two different species. So you have to say that this definition is irrelevant for asexual reproduction. That is one problem. The other is male and female. Given any male and female, let's say for example in the human species, two males cannot mate and reproduce, two females cannot mate and reproduce, therefore it follows from this definition that any two human males belong to two distinct species and any two human females belong to two distinct species. That obviously is not the kind of consequence that we want, so this definition is seriously flawed. Three, the third problem with this definition is there exist cases where we judge two groups to belong to two different species very clearly and yet they produce, they mate and produce fertile offspring. So a classic example of example is tigers and lions. Uh, 
Uh, it's well known in the literature that they can produce, mate and produce fertile offspring. So according to this definition, tigers and lions should belong to two, the same species, and yet we treat them as belonging to the two different species. <coughs> and it's well known that organism across different species, across widely different branches, can actually produce crossbreed and produce fertile offspring. So this definition just doesn't work. It's as good as as good as saying this is the worthless definition. There is no way of even saving the definition. What is it that is that this definition is trying to express though? It is trying to express the idea that what is relevant for speciesood is interaction. Mating, um, mating is a form of sexual interaction. And what this definition is intuitively trying to get at is that species is not a matter of simply trait characteristics, but societal interaction. There could be other forms of interaction. It picks on mating as the form of interaction. But by itself, that is not sufficient nor is it actually uh, necessary, as you know in the case of asexual reproduction. So, how do we define species? <clears throat> there are two or three different ways of looking at this problem. One is to begin with the concept of lineage, and then define species in terms of lineages. The other is in terms of traits and trait values. So this is ancestry, this is structure, and the third possibility is interaction. And we'll explore each of these possibilities in a search for a definition of species. Let's begin with the concept of lineage. What do we mean by that? Lineage simply is a relation between parents and offspring and their offspring and their offspring and so on. So it's really a chain of parent offspring relation. A chain of parent offspring pairs. We'll refine, define this notion a little more after looking at a few examples, but that's the basic idea. So let's take uh, bacteria. This is the clearest case. You have one ancestor, one bacterium, dividing into two, these dividing into two, and those again dividing into two, and so on. So in the end, you're going to have a large number of a huge population of bacteria coming from a single ancestor. This, you will say, is a lineage. So all these bacteria belong to a single lineage, uh, in the sense like this. Of course, you could think of this as the, if you're thinking of the lineage of the descendant, then you, this is the lineage. If you're thinking of the lineage from this perspective, all these branches that go on here are lineages. So that's the basic idea that we want to capture. So what we need to say is, in addition to this, we have to say, uh, with a single ancestor, that's one. So a single ancestor, and all its descendants. Now, that's fine for asexual reproduction, but the situation in sexual reproduction is somewhat different. So let's take humans, for example. You have a male and a female reproducing, and then you have several offspring, another male and female reproducing, 
giving rise to several offspring, yet another male, female, several offspring. And then what you're going to find is that you have a female here, and then you have a male here, and they reproduce to create several offspring. And maybe this female will also interact with this male, and then... So what, what you see here is that there is, uh, there is no single ancestor for all these if you're looking at the male and female population. Any organism here could have multiple ancestors, and any, any male-female pair, any parent, any couple could have, again, multiple. So this is a many-to-many -many relation. So that definition will not work for the sake of sexual reproduction. So what you need to say is something like, not a single ancestor, but a single ancestor population. So all these will be the ancestor of this population. This is the ancestor population. This is the descendant population. But then, you, how do you delimit this? You can say, take any ancestor population and all the descendants will constitute the image. But then what if you exclude something? Okay, that what if you take only up to here? But these also constitute ancestors of this. So now what that means is that in this population, given this population, all the ancestors should be included. So what you need to say in addition is such that no descendant, descendant has any other ancestor. That will take care of the uh, definition of lineage in sexual reproduction as well. Is that sufficient? Uh, not really, but we may not go into the details here. The reason why I'm saying not sufficient is for the following reason. The notion parent is unclear because uh, parent in these cases may have a slightly different meaning. Let me go through some of those uh, problems here. Okay, so let's take let's get let's take the emergence of uh, eukaryotes. Eukaryotes, as you know, are organisms with cell nucleus. In contrast, prokaryotes have no cell nucleus. So current evolutionary theory says that in the beginning, you had prokaryotes. All organisms are prokaryotes. They came without cell nuclei. And then prokaryotes evolved into eukaryotes. So how does this happen? Well, the current idea is that you have one prokaryote and let us say you have another prokaryote, slightly bigger. And what happens is that this organism envelops this organism, so something like this. And then ultimately, this results in one, originally what was one prokaryote, containing another prokaryote inside it, and this starts dividing. 
Okay, now if you take the eukaryote here, who is the ancestor? This, of course, is an ancestor, but you have this also as an ancestor pair. But this is not a matter of sexual reproduction. This is a different kind of interaction. Um, you have similar cases in uh, lateral gene transfer. In lateral genes transfer, you have, uh, you have a species here and different organisms. You have another species here, a different organisms, and some of the genes get transferred to this. So the question would be, if you have this situation, if you take these descendants, obviously these are ancestors, but how about these? Because some of the genes come from here. Should you, do you want to include these as part of the ancestry? You could def redefine this to include these cases as well. And the most striking case is that of a special kind of amoeba called dictostelium. Um, I'm not sure about whether spelling is Y or I, as a matter. I have never been good at spelling. And this kind of amoeba have a unicellular existence uh, if there is enough food, so they exist as a kind of population, unicellular. But when food is quite scarce, what happens is all these guys come together to create uh, a single multicellular organism, which can then reproduce in sexual uh, reproduction in I'm not sure if it is sexual reproduction or not. They, no, they produce spores and they give birth to their descendants. So if you take these guys, this organism is the ancestor of this organism, but this organism has all these, this colony as an ancestor. So it is quite possible that all the multi multicellular organisms that we have now evolved in this form. That is multiple parents coming together to form a single organism and that organism giving birth to the other. So should we define ancestry lineage in such a way that these cases are also involved? That will be fairly complex definition of lineage. I'm not going to go into that. I simply present that as a challenge for the definition of lineage. And this is crucial. The, without a clear definition of lineage, you can't go on to define uh, species, but I'm going to sidestep that problem and go on to define species in terms of lineage now. Let's go back to the question of what's the species and the lineage definition would be something along these lines. If you have a lineage from now, let me give the picture of uh, asexual reproduction, bacteria for example. And you find that the traits of this ancestor are preserved in all of these, and all the traits that you have here at this level are also present here. If all the trait values, traits and traits values of this organism are present here in the ancestor, then there has been no evolution the way we have defined it, because we have defined evolution as in terms of the emergence of novel traits or trait values. So no evolution till now. Suppose you find that in the next stage, there exists trait value x, some trait value, not present here. Then you could say, well, that's, that's the beginning of a new species. Any 
novel trait that you will give rise to uh, a new species. So this is uh, so you could define species this way. <coughs> if in a lineage, this is a single lineage. If in a lineage, if you have the presence of a new trait value, that's a new species. You can say that is that is speciation. Emergence of a novel trait value in uh, a lineage. Now notice that this trait value that is present here could also come from a different lineage. And you could have a trait value x here as well, and many cases. But by this definition that we have, we are defining it in terms of lineages. That means this species and this species are distinct, even though they have the same trait value. Everything is the same. The only difference is lineage. You simply cannot put these two into a single lineage, and therefore, they belong to two different species. Whether or not this is a desirable uh, characteristic of the defini definition of species, that's for us to consider. I'm simply sketching the possibilities. So here's a possible way of approaching uh, the issue of uh, the definition of species. Now, here is the here's an important characteristic. This definition in terms of lineage assumes evolution. If you define species this way, you cannot use the concept of species in order to, in order to uh, argue for evolution. It will become problematic. So we are now assuming that species exist. Sorry, um, we are assuming that evolution exists. What other possible definitions can there be? Uh, you could think of structural definitions or definitions in terms of trait values. How do you do this? We can say something like a species is a population of organisms with a shared set of trait values. Now these trait values could be phenotypical traits, that is the observable traits such as blue eyes and black eyes and having two legs or having four legs and so on, or it could be uh, or genotypical in terms of molecular properties. So if you find, for example, you have a say, shared set of proteins, then you say, that's a species. This is, uh, this is the kind of definition of species that is uh, largely followed in phylogenetic attempt to uh, think, think about species. The difficulty here is this, how many shared traits will you say would constitute a single species? So after all, there are genotypical uh, or even phenotypical traits that are shared across all life forms. So for example, you could say all life forms have cell membranes. So would you say then that that's a single species? Uh, would you say that all life forms with the cell nuclei constitute one species? At what point would you say that two populations with the large number of shared traits constitute two distinct species? How much the question here would be not what is shared, but how much of differences will give you two different species? All life forms have shared traits, trait values. Um, this is not going to be answered, this is at best going to be arbitrary. Let me show you uh, an analogy that uh, illustrates the arbitrariness. And if you assume that all trait values are equal, try converting marks from 0 to 100 in a student population to divide them up into uh, a 
B, C, D, and F. These are categories. These are simply numbers ranges. So we have to cut these up into this. Well, how many do you need? Here, of course, I have assumed one, two, three, four, five species. We could say A plus A, A minus B, C, or B plus B, B minus, and so on. So you'll have about 10 different grades. You could say only three grades. Or you could put another one here, outstanding. You could make it, make it 12 grades. The decision of how many grades you're going to have is entirely arbitrary. It varies from university to university. Okay? Having said that, what would constitute A plus and what would constitute O? What would constitute A? At some point, you make some arbitrary cut and you say A plus is, uh, let us say, uh, 90 to 95 and O is 96 to 100. Why 90? Why 95? Entirely arbitrary. Okay. This is the kind of approach that we often find in the uh, trait value based approach to species, whether it is genotypical or phenotypical. Now, we don't know anything that is interesting about species. You are arbitrarily chopping up species and you have no behavioral patterns, no structural patterns, nothing that impinges upon these arbitrary cuts. It sheds no light on anything. So I'm going to reject these as um, exactly the same status as assigning grades to students. Okay, now let's go back to the idea that uh, Ernest Meyer had, which is interaction. So Maya's idea was that sexual interaction will give us something about speech, some uh, regularities of biological forms. So of course you say not simply sexual interaction, but any form of interaction. So take for example, sexual interaction, the mating interaction is only one of them. What are the other forms of interaction? Well, you could say social interaction in general we, we could in fact include mating as a form of sec social behavior, but there are other forms of social behavior which are not sexual, and that could be things like flocking, uh, brooding, and so on. So we see that quite often the organisms that flock together and move together, come together and move together, belong to the same species. There is a kind of uh, I, uh, similarity. So. Uh, we have the famous saying, birds of the same feather flock together. What this saying points to is, when you say same feather, what it means is same trait value. So if you look at organisms that flock together, you see a large number of shared trait values. So there is a connection between this and this. So it is that coming together of the flocking behavior and the sharedness of trait values that gives you this kind of unity. And I would suggest that this is where we should look for a definition of species, these two things together. And then we can ask, if you define species as a combination of these two, then we can ask, how does it impinge upon our notion of lineage? Um, notice that in the case of humans, humans are essentially a combination of many different species. So the bacteria that we have inside us, we will not be able to survive without those bacteria. So that the human body is actually an ecosystem with many different species living inside it. Historically, many different, but we think of it as a single, single um, organism. Exactly the same that we saw in the case of uh, the emergence of multicellular organisms from a, la a colony of unicellular organisms. That also is a form of interaction. Coming together to form a single multicellular organism is a form of social behavior. That's where the species definition would come in. What are the kinds of uh, cooperative behavior in addition to flocking uh, 
in addition to flocking that you find as part of uh, the social behavior of organisms, uh, you have classic cases of symbiotic behavior. And in many cases, we see these symbiotic groups as belonging to different species, but then we need to look at those cases carefully to see if there is some unity that we call species in all these interactions. Um, that allow us to distinguish species from colonies and ecosystems. All these are in fact slightly different intuitions about the same thing. That is, they interact, they collaborate, they cooperate, they come together, they group together, they come together in many different ways. And then the question would be, if you have a theory of species and a theory of colonies and a theory of ecosystems, we have a much better handle on evolutionary theory. So evolutionary theory is how these forms of interaction come, come about along with these trade differences in different lineages. I don't have a theory, I'm simply suggesting a way of constructing a theory of species, colonies, ecosystems, organisms. An organism is actually like a colony. All these should be treated as part of a single larger theory. Thank you.